church is uh, for people, right? The church is people, right? Right. Sometimes other folks come. <laughs> Sophia? Is she already leave? Uh, yeah, why don't you get her? Uh, I want to ask a couple questions. 
This is Sophia. She brought this in this morning. So <clears throat> life goes on, you know, and we, we come in and we all look pretty nice and we smell pretty nice and smile maybe. But we don't know what's going on inside of people, right? We can't always tell because some people are really good actors and actresses. And so we don't know what's really going on on the inside. Now, others of us have the scars and wounds, and you can see that. But not everyone can you see. So today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about Jehovah Rapha, which is the God who heals. I really like this last song you sang, Holly, um, about he is, he is there, he's available, and healing is in his hands. Well, what happened with his hands? Anybody? They were wounded for us, but healing is still in his hands. Here, if you come on up here, dear. Oop. Here, come on up just a little more. Who, who is this? Here, hold it. You hold this, dear. Who is this, Sophia? Do you want to? No? John, who's this? Uh, it's a bear. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the bear has a name. Is this? No, no, no. no. Has a dress. It's okay. It's okay. We can, we can sit down. So, anything you notice about the bear? Bear having a dress? I think that's pretty obvious that it's bear has. Isn't that obvious? Bears don't wear dresses. This one does. And then what else do you see? You said the ears? Yeah. Notice that? There's uh, scotch tape all over them. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what happened. I, I asked her this morning because I saw it, and I, she said something happened with the, with the computer. So I don't know what happened with the computer here, but um, something fell, and it hurt her ears. So she rearranges the tape periodically on this uh, to help the bear get healed. And I think that's cool. Yeah. So, um, so we'll let you take your bear back, okay, dear? Okay. Can we just say thank you? Thank you. So what I want you to do is take your notes, please. And I want you to listen on uh, how can God heal? Jehovah Rapha, as mentioned in your notes, is the Lord who heals. Aren't you glad that there's a God who heals? Um, whoever is needed to be healed. The word Rapha means to restore, to heal, to cure, to make whole, and it's some 67 times in the Old Testament. But there's only one time in the Old Testament when it links Jehovah, the Almighty, the all-powerful God, with healing. And we're going to look at that this morning. It's in Exodus chapter 15. Please turn there. Coming into Exodus 15, does anyone know what has happened prior to Exodus 15? What's the big deal that has ju just happened? Passover. The Passover in the context of a bigger picture of what? The Exodus. People, there was the <clears throat> 10 plagues that Moses and God put together to impact the culture to prove that God was greater than any of their false gods. And so every of those, one of those 10 plagues that went out was against one of their gods. And each time, of course, Jehovah was bigger than that. They, uh, Finally, Pharaoh said, you can go, leave here, get away. They ran away, and the people gave them funds and all sorts of things to go away. And they got to the Red Sea, and they couldn't go any further. And that's when uh, the people were scared, and Pharaoh's army was bearing down on them and was held off by God's hand. And then what happened? 
God opened the Red Sea. They parted through. And as they got to the other side, the, the Pharaoh's army is coming down, bearing down and through, this, through this opening and with the horses and chariots. And what happened was that the, the uh, Moses uh, held up the staff of God and the waters crashed down and destroyed Pharaoh's army. And it was a victorious, unbelievable day. You can imagine how panicked they were to get through to the other side because the army's coming fast. And God, in an instant, wiped out the army. So what kind of atmosphere would be built on that right there? Would they be sad, happy, glad? What, what would they be? <coughs> if you were there, what would you be? What? Unbelievably excited that God has pulled through. In, a, in an impossible situation, God has done something that no one else could do. And so you and God are like, like this, right? Just tight with God. And people are giving each other high fives, though they didn't do anything that God did it, you know, but they're giving each other high fives. And there's this whole song in chapter 15 where Miriam, which is Moses' older sister, sings. And it's like this gayest opportunity about what God has done. You ever go through times like that when life is just unbelievably great and God has come through at the last minute and you and God are tight? Well, watch what happens to that roller coaster at the end of uh, chapter 15. Verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the, sea of, uh, the Red Sea, where they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. How long can man live without water? Okay, so what does that mean? <coughs> Things are desperate. And anytime anybody mentions water and you can't have it, you think more about water. Right? So they're at the end of the rope here. They're gone out in the desert. Their leader has gone from the hero to a bad guy. What is he doing bringing us out into this desert? And people are really upset. They're scared. Verse 23. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why they named the place Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses. What are we to drink? Now, when they grumbled here, do you think there was a happiness grumble or a meanness grumble or like revenge grumble? I mean, they, they were just really upset. They thought they were going to die. And so they went from this exhilaration of God can do anything, us and God are tight, to why did you, Moses, bring us out here? All of a sudden, things are totally different three days later from the greatest excitement in their life. What are we to drink? Verse 25, then Moses cried out to the Lord, this is Jehovah now, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. That's really interesting. He took what was extremely bitter, what people saw as bitter, and he took the very same water, and God did something to it, and he turned it from bitter to better. It became sweet, and the people could drink it. And their thirst was quenched. Verse 25. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them. And there he what? Test. Tested them. This was a test. He said, watch this. You might want to underline this or highlight it. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God. And if parentheses, you do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, and if you keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of these diseases that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you, Jehovah Rapha. This whole thing was nothing but a test. God, had, God knew what he was going to do. <laughs> It surprised the people. And they were on this emotional roller coaster of, of fear of Pharaoh's army going to slay them to thrill of victory over all the bad problems that they had. And they were on the upside and life was going to be good. They walk out in the desert and they go back down into the, to the depths. They thought they were going to die. They were at the end of three days with no water. And they come to some water and it's bitter. They can't drink it. 
They see it there, but they can't do anything about it until God touches it. And God instructs Moses to take this log and throw it in there, and all of a sudden it becomes able to drink. Do you think they just took a teaspoon out and poured it in their mouth? Or do you think they just jumped in it and, and uh, drank it up and just poured water all over the place? You think? I think that's what they probably did. Now, I don't know what situation you're in this morning. I don't know if you got Pharaoh's army after you and you're scared or you got some type of disease that's crowding in on you or financial pressure or whatever it is and we're scared and so we run, we're looking for God and God shows up. But as you go, as you were down and go up, many times you go back down again. And what does it say here? It was a test. God hasn't changed in his ability to heal. God hasn't changed in his ability to do what he needs to do. He wants us to know who he is. Now, I understand when you're going through hard times. I mean, I've said this to God himself. It's like, God, I'm here. Do you actually see what's going on? It's not fair. Please show up. I'm ready. Maybe some of you are in that place this morning. The songs that we sang about were very moving. The healing is in his hands. And he, we can trust him. It's his timing and what he's going to do. We have to be ready for it. And willing. You notice there was conditions in that particular statement, verse 26. If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord and do what's right, you have to listen to God and do what's right. If you pay attention to my commands and keep all my decrees, he says, then I will not bring on you diseases. There are some things in our culture, people are getting all sorts of diseases because they aren't following God's law. God says, don't be immoral. Why? Because it's not holy for sure. There's issues there. But he says, it'll protect you from diseases. He says, don't, don't get drunk with wine. He says, don't curse other people. There's all sorts of things that God says, don't do this. And if we do it, then we can expect a consequence. But if we follow God, he said, he'll protect us. You know, we have a lot of teenagers here, you know, and the world is open to you, and your choices seem unlimited. Listen to this example here. Not just your mom and dad say that, but it says it here. And for those of us who are adults who think that we can do whatever we want, yeah, we can't. You see, we are not, our life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. We are the kings, sons and daughters. It says, therefore, glorify God with your body. So, the first one is, is that he is the Lord who heals. Second is he turns bitter to sweet. What do you have in your life that's bitter? That God wants to turn to sweet. And I made a couple of questions there. Is it physical? Is it an issue with your body? Your health? Is it an issue spiritual where you're struggling spiritually and it's not working for you and God wants you to heal something? in your spiritual life with him? Is it emotional? There's something on the inside and there's a feeling that goes on and you need some healing in, the, in your emotional health. Or is it relational with other people? And you know if something doesn't change, it's going down the hill. So you need to just check what, what area is it? God tested his people. He says, I am the Lord who heals you. The next is, we see that in the Old Testament, God desires to, um, is to deliver us from anxiety. And the purpose is to heal the hurt of his people. Turn to Psalm 147. <clears throat> Psalm 147.3.
He heals the what? Broken hearted. And he binds up their wounds. In other words, he sees and hears what's going on. I gave several instances of that in Exodus 3, 7, and 8. It's uh, the story of right after the burning bush. And God gets Moses' attention. This is a test, by the way. And then he says, by the way, I've heard the moaning of my people of Israel down in Egypt. I see what's going on. And I am concerned for them. God hears. And then he turns and points his finger to Moses and says, by the way, I'm sending you to go get them. <laughs> but he hears that. Now, sometimes there's an underlying issue of sin that has caused issues. Sometimes it's things that we do. In Luke 5, 31 and 32, it says, He is called, Christ came to call sinners to repentance. He's not out to find the healthy and do something for them. He's out to find the sick. Number two, there are different types of healing. There's physical, spiritual, emotional, and relational, and probably many others. There's different kinds of healing. And unfortunately, what, what happens is, is we get, we go pray with somebody, or you have a, a prayer time. What do we almost always pray for? Physical. physical healing. That's right, almost always. You know, someone is sick, or someone has cancer, or someone is in a, a serious issue health-wise, or their child is sick. Or, now, are those important? Does God care about them? Absolutely. And is it a felt pain? Absolutely. But there's other issues, too, that God wants us to be concerned about. And it's not just physical. You talk to anyone who's involved in the persecution of the, um, of the church in other areas of the world, the persecuted church. You know, they don't often pray for healing or for their people to get out of the situation that they're in, captivity or whatever. You know what they pray for? Courage, strength, understanding, commitment to God, that they will go through the test and come out on the other side victorious. So think about that, about what kind of healing is really the issue for you. I, um, my wife and I do uh, seminars for people, uh, for marriages, actually, to build up marriages, as you know. And uh, it's something we love to do. Uh, we're good at it. It's fruitful. We see people's lives change. And uh, it's interesting. And we've done it in a number of areas. We've done it here. We've done it in other places. But uh, let me say this. Is something came to me uh, when I was traveling with my wife, it's new information. I didn't know this. We were talking about some of the situations that have happened, and um, I'm not a charismatic or Pentecostal preacher. You know that. Uh, but I have really good friends who are, whom I really love as brothers and whom I trust, and I, they're good men. Um, but when it comes to the spiritual gifts, there's certain things that we do and don't do, just kind of a path that we have, and it's our niche. We try to be as biblical as possible. But when it comes to things like the more showy gifts, like <clears throat> uh, speak, let's say speaking in tongues, for instance, uh, we would say, you can, have, you can speak in tongues. We just don't do it here in the service because it causes confusion. So if you want to use it in your own prayer life or at home, go for it, if that's where God has gifted you. When it comes to things like healing, I don't know many people with the gift of healing. And it sounds over, you know, Sounds amazing, and I question some of the validity of some of the people that I see on TV who are gift of healing. And so, you know, it's like a curious thing. And <clears throat> we were coming back um, from one of our seminars one day, and, and uh, Don and I started talking about what happens when we do our ministry that God has given to us about becoming a team of two and, and healing paths and giving people a new vision for where they need to head together as a couple. And, 
and uh, using tools, communication tools and things like that. And here's what happened, how the conversation went down. We, we were reflecting on one particular instance where we had met with a couple, and I won't use their names, but let's say it's uh, uh, Bob and Sharon, okay? Uh, we were at a, one of our, the seminars, and, and we often coach couples afterwards in between the sessions, and if they're willing. And so this couple came up to us, and they said, can we meet you for dinner? We said, sure. So uh, we met with them, and they didn't sit in the main place where the regular people were. They took us out and kind of in a real private area. I said, okay. So we got our meal, and we started talking, and said, so what would you, where would you like to be at the end of our talk? And they said, well, we would like, you had mentioned something about healing, and we need some issues addressed. And um, Sharon said, my husband did some things that really offended me. I said, how long ago? She said, eight years. And she says, I've never forgiven him for it, and it's his problem. And you shouldn't have done that. And, and so I, I turned to Bob and I said, yep. He says, yep, that's, I did that. And he says, we don't know what to do, how to get oh. over this thing. And so I looked at Donna and she nodded and we took a tool, a mental tool out of one of our communication tools, which is called healing the ledger. A ledger is what you have in a bank statement, which is plus and minuses. And you want to make sure that it's always above in the positive, right? At the end of the ledger. Well, sometimes something happens and you make a, real huge deposit and it destroys the amount and you're in a negative stance and that's where they were. I said, well, here's what we can do. I said, we can go back in and we can talk about that situation just a little bit. I don't need to know the details. I would just talk about it and say, what happened? And they said, okay. I had them ask permission of each other. Is it okay if we do this? And they said, yes. It was a safe place. You could talk. And um, so Bob started. He said, well, first of all, I said, I want to say again. He said, I, I made, did some things that I'm really sorry for. It. Um, and she said, well, why did you do that? See how quiet it is in here? And he said, well, here's what was going on in my world, and here's what was going on in your world. And he wasn't condemnatory. He was just saying, you weren't available for me, and you didn't hear me. And she, it was interesting, because I was watching Sharon's face, and it was like shock. She thought it was all his fault. And she realized that she was part of this whole dilemma too. And they both teared up. She says, I'm so sorry. She said, I'm so sorry. He said, well, I'm sorry too. And I said, okay, time out. Sorry doesn't cut it here. You can be sorry and still be mad, right? You can be sorry and tell somebody off the next moment. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry, whatever. And I didn't go into that. I said, actually, you don't do that. So what we're going to do, instead of saying, I'm sorry, here's a bigger word called forgiveness. And so what you need to say, I did this. I admit it was wrong. Just that little A word, I admit. How many people admit that they've done something wrong, you know? I admit I did it wrong. And she goes, I admit that I wasn't there for you, and I did it wrong. And then they said, let's tell each other you forgive them. She says, I forgive you, but will you forgive me? And he said the same thing. And I said, okay, now that we've kind of washed the slate clean, now you need to rewrite the program. It's kind of like a computer. You have to rewrite the program. And say, what would you say now, if you're in that situation, what would you say now? And I turned to Bob and I said, what would you say now that would be different than what you did last time? And he said what he would do different. And he said, this won't ever happen again because of who you are. I love you. And it's unconditional and the whole thing. And she said, here's what I would do different next time. And they rewrote the program. And I said, you can tell each other thank you for hearing me and they did and said you can hug or kiss or whatever you want to do and they did very tender they were crying and all of a sudden big smiles came on their faces I said what just happened she said we're healed now I saw them 
the next couple days, and they were indeed happier. They're sitting closer. And I reflected on that with Dawn and, and uh, some other situations that we've done like that and where we've seen people healed. And she says, you know what? She says, I think we have the gift of healing. So what do you mean? She said, God can use us in our abilities, and we share our life too, which God has healed emotionally. And she says, I think we can heal each other, people emotionally. And it was like, somebody slapped me in the face. It was like, I have never thought of that. And this is a pastor who studies the Bible all the time and who speaks thousands of sermons. I've never thought about the gift of healing because I was, I was locked into this healing somebody physically, you know? I don't do that. I'm just not gifted there. Now, I pray for people who are sick and whatnot, and God does what he wants to do, but I don't feel gifted there. But at healing, emotionally, I understand that one. And God has healed me emotionally, too, with some stuff I, that I've done, you know? And all of a sudden, I realized that God is a sovereign God, and he is using us in a different way than I thought. So I tested it. I asked some of the leaders here, and I said, what do you think about this? Does this make sense? And they go, well, yeah. You've been doing it for years. And I thought after, I thought, well, why don't you say something? But of course, they, <laughs> <coughs> they didn't. Um, but it was just an interesting thing. So God was, I mean, I had other kinds of gifts, but all of a sudden, there's a realization that here's a gift that God can use in an interesting way. But it's exer- we're exercising it, we're using it, and God is blessing it. Now, don't you all sign up, call me next week and say I need emotional healing. But um, the point is, is that, do you understand what I'm saying? Is that God is understanding and the situation and the need, and he's equipping us through tough, we went through some tough stuff. And, uh, and we studied this whole emotional thing. I remember uh, we went to a seminar years ago, and uh, I learned a tremendous amount of what emotion, they call it emotional intelligence. And much of the Psalms is written about emotions. David just writes a lot about how he feels about things. And it's like I told somebody actually here, I said, hey, I, I learned a whole bunch of things about emotional healing. And he said, I bet your wife really enjoyed that. You know, like, that's a tough one, you know? I said, it was, but it was good for me too. So that, I just tell you that to let you know that I'm a learner too, and I haven't arrived. But I understand even deeper why God allowed my wife and I to go through some really hard stuff. And so you know about that. You know, in the church and people, relational stuff. Ooh. And God has healed that. And so it almost looks like every week somebody gets healed of something. And that's a cool thing. But it's not me. It's God who uses me and my wife together to help people get healed. So, my point is, and then I was talking to a, actually a pastor friend who called me from another state just this week, and he said, oh, that's an interesting comment that you say that. He said, did you know in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to ask you to turn there. Um, let me see, did I write it down? No, but it's 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse, I'm going to start in verse uh, 7, I guess. First Corinthians 12, starting in 7. Paul is talking about the gifts. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit. And he said, did you notice anything there? I said, what? Every one of them is singular, except when it comes to healing. And it says gifts. Not to the gift of healing, but to the gifts of healing. And I thought, my goodness, I'm not a physical healer, but I can he- help heal people emotionally or spiritually. And oftentimes that impacts them relationally. So I thought, I'm just, and I said, do you know what I'm speaking on? I told this pastor, I said, I'm talking this week about the God who heals. Interesting. So I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here is that, that there's a theme here that 
we've chosen to go through the names of God, but God uses this to speak to me as the preacher saying, listen up, bud. If you understand what God is doing, it'll even be more powerful for you. And for, you as a ch- for us as a church, where are we going? What are your gifts and what is God using you? To some of you have the gift of healing maybe, where you can heal people relationally or physically or emotionally or spiritually. So, just kind of interesting. Psalm 32, turn there please. David writes much in the Psalms, it is very beautiful. Now, when we go to 1 John 1, 9, it says what? Okay. Okay, if we confess our sins, he is righteous, he is faithful, and forgive us. He will forgive us of all our sin. So we know that God forgives all of our sin. But in Psalm 32, notice what it says. I'm going to start in verse 3. This has to do with, a lot of times people are, are, stuff is going on in their own world, and they don't tell anybody. Verse 3 of Psalm 32. Actually, let me start in verse 1, because it's just really good here. It sets up the context. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So he sets it up saying, um, be forgiven. Two, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit there is no deceit. So he's saying, get, get healed by God spiritually here. And then it goes into verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through, all my, through my groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped. As in the heat of the summer. What was that? I think that's talking about your conscience too. In other words, when you know you've done something wrong, the, it's like the hand of God is pressing on your back. Or you feel this weight in your chest. And it's like God is trying to get your attention. And you feel lousy. Notice verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the What? guilt of my sin. Not only does God forgive sin, he forgives the guilt of your sin. Emotional. He forgives what's going on, what you're thinking about. Because a lot of times people will pray and ask God to forgive them. He does. But then they have this other thing like, man, God could never really forgive me. Well, didn't you just ask God to forgive you? Yes. But God could never forgive me for this. Well, it's the guilt of your sin. And what does it say there? God does what? You forgave the guilt of my sin. So he can go back in and cleanse us of all the stuff. Very interesting, I thought. Verse 6, Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach you. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And it's just the person who's done this, who's confessed their sins, who's gotten right with God, who's tried to say, okay, cleanse me, God. He does that, and he forgives the guilt, and so you're, you're clean again. This is an awesome thing for those of us who might sin. That's a little joke there, because all of us sin. Even if you're a Christian, you're going to sin. So what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with the guilt of that? Now, you don't be presumptuous on this. And presume on the grace of God saying, hey, if I'm going to get forgiven, I can go do whatever I want because I'm going to get forgiven. Well, that's not what this is saying at all. Because you can be forgiven by a gracious, holy, awesome God, don't take advantage of that because there are consequences to choices. So this is really, really interesting thinking here. Number three, Jehovah who heals in the Old Testament is the Jesus who heals in the New Testament. It's just consistent. He does all sorts of things. Turn to Luke 7, please. In Luke 7, Jesus has started his ministry. And John the Baptist's ministry is kind of winding down. And there's a new guy on the, on the front called Jesus. And things are picking up. 
And the disciples come to John saying, you know, who do we follow here? And so he sends them to go speak to Jesus. And in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 18, John's disciples, this is John the Baptist, told him about these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we look for somebody else? In other words, are you the Messiah? Verse 20, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. What he's doing is he's quoting Isaiah about what the Messiah will do when he'll come and he'll be healing people. And so when we think of Jesus' ministry, a lot of what he did was healing of people. And we think, wow, that's a great demonstration of that. But there's a point where he comes in and he says, you know what? The healing is not what I'm about. You turn back to Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. There's a story about a paralytic man who, uh, who his friends bring on a stretcher. You know, there's four guys that bring the stretcher to Jesus so he can heal their friend. And they get there, and there's a whole crowd around the house they can't get in. And so there's a creative guy in the group. He says, let's go up on the roof that's flat, and we can tear a hole down, and we can drop it down in there. So they, they make this gaping hole in the roof. I wonder if they came back and talked to the guy who owned the house. <laughs> what do you think, Jay? Do you think they did? <laughs> I think they did. But... So they lower this cot now with their friend down in right before Jesus. So while Jesus is speaking in the house and people are hanging out the windows and listening in and trying to get it all, there's, there's these guys and hay, hay is falling down from the roof down in front of Jesus. And everybody, Jesus stops and he watches and the cot is low, lowered down right in front of him. And Jesus says, and the, guy, the four guys are up in the roof still looking down because they couldn't get down. The guy's down there. He can't walk. Jesus says to the man, what, what does he say to the man? Your sins are forgiven. Well, hello, he didn't come for that. <laughs> right? He didn't come to have his sins forgiven. But Jesus says, in seeing their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And then there's a whole bunch of grumbling going on. Like, yeah, who can say that? Only God can say that. And they're, they're grumbling about what he does. And he says, to prove to you who I am, my relationship with the king, and that I have authority. Get up from your bed and walk. And the man does. Can you imagine what happened in there? So what did he do there? He healed the man, but that was a secondary issue. His healing on him was to prove that he was God and that he had authority. He, had, he was deity. He was God himself. That was what he was trying to show was your sins are forgiven. That was the biggest issue. Oh, and by the way, I'll heal you too. So when we look for healing of people, in many cases, there's sin and issues that have to be healed first before other true healing can happen. And we go in and we say, oh, I got this owie on my finger and it hurts and, and fix this. And we can fix this. There's hyperbole here, of course. But what caused the owie on the finger? What, did, what was going on? Was it something somebody else did? Was it something you did? Was it a choice you made? What is it? So let's go back and heal that issue too. And then, oh, we, by the way, we can help fix the finger. <laughs> so think about that. Even as parents, you know, when you go in and you see one of your, you got three kids there and one of them is crying. We often say what? to the other two. What'd you do? <laughs> you might want to separate them and ask each one what they did. Because sometimes the one that's crying had a little justice given back to him, you know? Okay. I don't want to meddle too far here. So the healing here was, is he says, I'm, I am Jesus. I'm the healer. And it, he refers back to Isaiah saying, I'm the one. But I didn't come for healing, actually. I came 
to heal men's hearts from sin so that they can do and be with me forever in paradise. Now I can heal their hurt and physicalness and so they can have a better life for 70 or 100 years. But I'm really concerned about the hearts of men so that they can be healed forever. I know some of you are in the medical profession here. And every now and then, God opens up opportunities for you to share your faith. And I commend you for that. Because you get to heal people from the inside as well as the outside. So there's the issue there. That's what's going on. Just in one more verse here, this is out of 1 Peter 2.24. He says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. What is he talking about? He said he died on the tree. What tree is he talking about? The cross. And he was wounded there, and he died. By his wound, you have been healed. Now, a lot of times people take that out of context, and they'll say, well, we can be healed physically of all our diseases. Well, that's really not what the context is saying. It's saying that you can be healed spiritually, and that has ramifications probably elsewhere when you're emotional or your body and things like that. But the primary issue there is that you can be healed spiritually before God and be a whole person. So my question for you today is this, and we're going to open it up for people to come forward if they want to have prayer for it. It's more than just physical healing that we have going on here. We have emotional healing, people that are hurt on the inside and that they need to be fixed. We have people with relational issues. And Holly mentioned earlier about forgiving each other. We have physical healing. There's all sorts of things, and there's different, more information on this in the Bible than what I just said this morning. But if you want to have uh, someone pray with you on this, and you can be honest, please come up. And I'm going to ask the elders and their wives to come up, please. And uh, you can pick someone to choose to pray with and share your story within 30 seconds, and then let them pray for you, please. But the bigger question is, is what about you? How can you bring healing to others is the last question. How do you do that? Do you listen to someone and the, give them the gift of listening? You can just stand right across here, folks. Thanks. What about forgiveness? Can you listen to someone and actually heal them? And just say, God, I, let me join with you and let God heal you. You need to give something to someone or serve someone somehow or pray for them. So this is what we have. is a great opportunity for you to say, you know what I mean? Business with God. Jehovah Rapha. And uh, may we as a church be even more healthy. So as we play this song, uh, listen to the words. It's a powerful song. And then once you come forward, we'll be happy to pray with you and then release you for the rest of the day, okay? Okay.